Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Huda. I'm your host, Jamil Rashid. Very happy to say we have with us again Sheikh Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Sheikh. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. It's Jazak my pleasure, Yaqi. Jazakallah for being with us again. Okay, today's uh, episode is going to be solely on questions we've taken before, written questions, email questions. So please do not telephone us. We won't be taking any calls today. We'll be solely uh, attending to those questions from the, from the internet. Uh, Sheikh, the first question I have uh, is regarding Hajj. I know we, we're coming close to, to, to Hajj. A brother asked a question regarding if he performs Hajj, for example, and he returned to his home country, and he did not perform the Tawaf al-Ifada. What's his position now? Does his Hajj still stand? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyyihi wa mustafa. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful. Praise be to Allah. We praise him and we seek his help. Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show him guidance. Uh, may peace and blessing be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At-Tawaf, and particularly Tawaf al ifadah is the, one of the pillars of Hajj. When they say pillars or rukn of Al-Arkan, if, if a person does not do it, the Hajj will be nullified. Accordingly, it cannot be made up by any penalty or ransom. That means that person, even though he left, home, he left uh, Mecca and did not do Tawaf al uh, and went home. He must come back and perform a Tawaf al Then, of course, Tawaf al once again. And if this person is coming back, no matter where he coming from, because he did not complete his Hajj yet, uh, I would advise him to assume an intention of Ihram for Umrah, because the Prophet ﷺ recommended that whenever a person is entering Mecca, should enter it with an intention of Ihram. Uh, and it is not time for Hajj, so he would do Umrah, then afterward he would do Tawaf al Ifada, followed by Tawaf al Wada', then leave. Okay, Jazakallah, Sheikh. Okay, the second question leads on to this. It says, What are the different types of Tawaf? I mean, where do they get their names? Where, where are they based from? I'm glad this question is being asked because whenever people read in books, there is Tawaf al Ifada, they don't know what is the difference between uh, Tawaf al Ifada, Tawaf al Wada', and Tawaf al Qudum. Uh, each one is different from the other. And of course, there is the voluntary Tawaf or Tawaf al Tatawa. The very first one, which is arrival tawaf, and that's why the name is taken from the word arrival, tawaf al qudum. Uh, this is basically if the person is performing umrah or performing hajj, then he begins by the umrah, of course. Once you enter Mecca, the first activity you would do is to perform a tawaf. This tawaf, this very first tawaf, is known as tawaf al qudum. Uh, it differs from the rest of the other tawafs in certain uh, 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 traditions, such as that a person will be recommended to do a few things, such as الرمل والإطباع and this is particularly for men, not for women. الرمل uh, is to walk briskly in the first three rounds of a tawaf. A tawaf mm. is seven rounds around the Kaaba, beginning by the black stone corner and ended up at the same place. So you jog or you walk briskly in the first three rounds. And الإطباع is whenever the pilgrim would uncover the right shoulder and wrap the rida around the left one. And this uh, way of wearing the rida or uh, the ihram clothes is specifically in the very first tawaf, which is tawaf al qudum. That means it is totally wrong to see somebody doing the sa'i while uncovering the right shoulder. Mm -hmm. And this is very common. Or to see somebody while praying sunnah al tawaf, the two rakahs of tawaf after completing his tawaf while uncovering uh, the right shoulder. Yeah. Once you're done with the first tawaf, that's it. That means in any other tawaf that follows, whether it's a voluntary tawaf, tawaf al ifada, which is one of the pillars of Hajj, or tawaf al wada', which is a mandatory tawaf, a person is not supposed to do either al ramal nor al ittaba', jogging nor uncovering the right shoulder. So this is the first tawaf, which is tawaf al qudum, mm -hmm. which is also the pillar of uh, the umrah. Tawaf al ifada is upon coming back from the ninth day of Arafah, arriving back to Mina, throwing the stones. People are ready now to do Tawaf al ifada. Uh, it was called ifada because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَإِذَا أَفَضْتُمْ مِنْ عَرَفَاتِ Return back from Arafat. As we mentioned in the previous answer for the previous question, that Tawaf al ifada is one of the pillars of Hajj that we must do. It begins. Uh, it's beginning time on the 10th of the month of Dhul-Hijjah. 
and it goes all the way, not only the days of at tashriq 11th, 13th, and 14th, it, it's even extended to the end of the month of the Hijjah, and some scholars said it's endless. Such as the case of the brother who left without performing tawafu al-ifadah, we say you must go back and perform tawafu al-ifadah because it is one of the main pillars of hajj and cannot be made up by any means. You cannot even ask somebody to do it on your behalf. This is exactly similar to praying asr three rak'ahs instead of four. You have to pray the missing rak'ah. You have to fulfill the pillar which you've missed of the hajj so that you would have your hajj uh, complete. Then tawaf al wada' which is the last activity that the pilgrim would do before making uh, uh, departing Mecca, right before departure. It's called tawaf al wada' because uh, the, the farewell. You're giving a farewell to the place, to the Kaaba, to Mecca by performing tawaf. A person should keep in mind that if I'm leaving uh, in two or three hours from now, then I better go and make tawaf al wada' Very normal tawaf, but it is mandatory. If the person missed tawaf al wada' and did not do it, then he can make it up because it's wajib by offering a sacrifice or penalty, which is slaughtering a sheep. It has to be slaughtered in Mecca and distributed among the poor people of Mecca. Who will be exempted from tawaf al wada' Women during their menses. People who have postponed tawaf al ifada until right before their departure. Tawaf al ifada could also suffice them for both, as tawaf al ifada and tawaf al wada' because it happened to be the last activity they would do before leaving Mecca. Now, what do we do while staying the rest of the days in, uh, in Mecca? Uh, Nabi Sallallahu recommended us to do tawaf as many times as we can because at tawaf is a salah. The only difference between at tawaf and salah that in at tawaf we move and we speak, while in at salah we only recite what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala prescribed for us to be recited in at salah. But they both require tahara, wudu, and of course purity from the minor and the major impurity. That's why women during their uh, their menses they can never do uh, tawaf. So, tawaf at tatawa mm -hmm. or the voluntary tawaf can be done at any time, day or night, that once you enter the masjid, any masjid, there is a confirmed sunnah to offer two rak'ahs which are the greeting of mm -hmm. the masjid. Mm -hmm. But if you enter the masjid al-haram, the Kaaba, if you do tawaf around the Kaaba seven times, that would suffice you. So that would be considered as the greeting of al masjid al-haram, then you don't have to do sunnah tahiyat al-masjid. But if you don't, then you don't <coughs> sit down. You pray the current prayer or any nafl, or you initiate independent two rak'ahs, sunnah, tahiyyat, and masjid al-haram. Any day or night, the Prophet said, do not prevent anyone from performing tawaf day and night around mm -hmm. the haram, around the Kaaba. Jazakallah khair. Okay, now we come to the a third question here. Uh, it's regarding the term ikhsaq. Now, what are the consequences of somebody falling into this situation? First, we have to define the term ikhsaq for our viewers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Al-Ihsar is a state of uh, being restrained from fulfilling or completing the Hajj rituals. Mm -hmm. If a person, due to some outside factors, not in his control, not a choice, um, was physically ill, disabled, natural disaster, after commencing in a state of Ihram, then he was not able to complete the manasik. Duba'a bint Zubair, one of the lady companions, the Prophet ﷺ asked her personally that whether she was planning to go for Hajj, she said, I'm afraid I can't because I'm ill. The Prophet ﷺ said, go for Hajj wa shtariti, shtariti yani put a condition that, say, wa mahilli haythu habastani. Yani my state of tahallul and exiting the condition of ihram is wheresoever you restrain me. This is out of my choice, out of my control. I do not choose it. I got severely ill, I got disabled, natural disaster, excuse me, or anything that prevented me from completing the Hajj rituals, at that, my Hajj is over. And I don't have to offer the sacrifice. The sacrifice is due upon the completion of the Hajj, or even if the person did not complete his Hajj, if he did not put this condition, if he did not say, That's why the scholars say that it's recommended for a person who is afraid due to illness, that he might not be able to complete the Hajj rituals to say and making the intention of Al-Ihram and Al-Talbiyah, Labbayka Allahumma Labbayk, and to say along with that, Wa mahilli 
حيث حبستني. This is the state of إحصار. If it happens and the person would be restrained, then he's free. He does not owe anything. He can just go home at that. Jazakallah. Okay, now we've, we've got a question which is a, a very common question, but something very important. It's, it's about somebody really worrying about their state. A brother says, I've earned my earnings unlawfully. Uh, I've made repentance, sincere repentance. He says, after this now, can I go and perform Hajj with this unlawful earning? When we discussed before the conditions of repentance to be accepted, we mentioned that the person should uh, regret should quit, should recognize that he was committing the sin. And he should fix anything that went wrong during his ma'asiyah or his sin. That would include if the person have made any earning from unlawful means, he should get rid of that. Because this earning is haram and unlawful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, is tayyib, la yaqbalu illa tayyiba. As the Prophet sallallahu mentioned in the sound hadith, inna Allah ta'ala tayyib, la yaqbalu illa tayyiba. So Allah would not accept any ibadah which was done by unlawful means. Mm -hmm. Would not accept any charity from unlawful earning. So that's why the best bet of a person who made his earning from interest, from stealing what Allah had prohibited, from stealing, from robbing, is to get rid of this. Number one, if he uh, confiscated or took the property of another person, one of the conditions of his repentance is to render this back to who really owns it. Hmm. If he made it due to selling and buying, while it is prohibited, dealing with anything that Allah prohibited, then he should get rid of it, or as much as he assumes this earning was due to this unlawful mm -hmm. uh, transaction, would get rid of that much, and the rest will be, according to his assumption, is halal. If, if it is enough for him to make the halal, to make hajj from what he assumes halal earning, that's perfectly fine. But to say that the hajj will be accepted, hajj will be accepted if a person uh, steers to perform Hajj or uh, collects the interest sum and performs Hajj out of that, no, that would not be accepted because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is good and He only accepts that which is good. In addition to Fi Surat Al Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Innama Allahu min al -muttaqeen. As a matter of fact, this verse should be very sufficient to answer this question. It's only the righteous ones whom Allah accepts from them. So if the earning is not from lawful means. If the person is not righteous, is not sincere, then the action will be rejected and not be accepted. Jazakallah Okay, Sheikh, we've got a question uh, about the khutbah, about the Imam giving the khutbah. While he's doing this act, uh, we see people making tawaf. Now, we know the tawaf is an act of worship, like we know. So what's the situation? Is this allowed to perform tawaf while a khutbah is going on? Uh, this is actually an issue where the previous scholars, such as Al Imam Malik or Imam Shafi'i, may Allah have mercy on uh, them, uh, dealt with, and there is a dispute between the scholars concerning whether it's permissible or not. I would take, for instance, the view of Al Imam Malik, uh, uh, may Allah have mercy on him, Imam Ahl al Madina, who stated that if while the Imam is giving the khutbah, it is prohibited for a person to offer any prayer other than the greeting of the masjid, and it should be quick and brief. Mm -hmm. If a person enter the masjid, we said that Tahiyatul Masjid is a confirmed sunnah, that the person must do it. Mm -hmm. uh, while the Imam is giving the khutbah, he is allowed to do Tahiyatul Masjid and briefly. Other than that, any prayer is prevented and not allowed during the khutbah or the, the sermon delivery. Accordingly, a person should not do tawaf while the Imam is giving the khutbah or delivering the sermon. Al Imam Shafi'i yet said, that uh, there is no contradiction because while the Imam is giving the khutbah and while the person is making tawaf, he could be listening as well. We actually tend to take the view of Al Imam Malik and there should not be any contradiction between the ibadat. Mm -hmm. You do one thing at a time. Al khutbah is an act of worship. Listening attentively is an act of worship. And the Prophet ﷺ warned one would talk or even answer somebody else while the Imam is delivering khutbah to Jum'ah by saying that even if you say to somebody, hey, be quiet, that can affect your khutbah, your prayer. فَقَدْ لَغَى فَقَدْ لَغَوْتْ Accordingly, I would advise the person 
once the Imam begins his khutbah and say Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, sit wherever you are, then after Salatul Jumu'ah, resume tawaf from wherever you stopped. Jazakallah Okay, we're going to uh, take another question <coughs> about prayer this time. Um, it's quite a long question, so I'm going to read the whole question out and uh, you can make whatever it is from that. Uh, the brother asks basically, um, we have a situation, I want to correct my salah, my sunan salah. Uh, basically, the way I pray is as follows. Um, two rakahs before fajr, two rakahs before and after dhuhr, two rakahs before asr and two rakahs after salat al-maghrib and two rakahs before and after salat al-isha. Now, the next line is where the clarification needs to, to happen. Uh, actually, the sister Fatima, she says, now please let me know which method I should follow, the above or the Huda TV method. So uh, it needs to be clarified here. Well, I have some reservations on, on the last comment because uh, there is nothing called uh, the Huda TV method. Uh, there is the Sunnah method, which we're all trying to follow uh, strictly. Uh, the first format, mm -hmm. which he said that two before Fajr, two before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, and two after Maghrib and two after Asha, uh, leaves us with ten rak'ahs of nawafil throughout the day and the night, and these are the confirmed sunan or as sunan or rawatib. This is valid as well. This is very fine. The way we recommend it in our program, which is the Prophet's prayer, is due to a very sound hadith, which was narrated by Aisha Umm al Mu'minin, may Allah be pleased with her, when she said that the Prophet ﷺ said, one who observes regularly uh, 12 rakahs during a day or night, I'm talking about the volunteer prayers, the sunnah or rawatib, uh, Allah will build a house for him in paradise. And we uh, indicated that a person would offer them as follows, two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr, two by two, then two after Dhuhr, and two after Maghrib, and two after Asha. So the difference we added to uh, before Dhuhr, which is according to sound narrations as well. Whether you do this or that, th these are both valid. But according to the text, which uh, if you wish Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to build a house for you in paradise, you would do that. Jazakallah khair. Okay, we're going to go to <coughs> back to another question uh, about Hajj. Now, the person wants some explanation to what does the meaning of standing in our family? Does it actually mean actually the actual standing? What, what's the actual meaning behind this? One of the pillars of Hajj is al wuqufu bi arafah and if we go to interpret the word wuquf, literally means to stand. And this is what you would read in some English books. Yet it's not necessarily to be standing in Arafah. al wuquf bi Arafah means its significance and it means to be at Arafah, mm -hmm. at the place of Arafah, whether it is the mountain or the entire valley except a place called Muhassir. Uh, from Dhuhr, any time from Dhuhr or noon of that day, the ninth day of the month of Dhul Hijjah, till the Fajr of the next morning, the morning of the 10th. Any moment you happen to be there in the valley of Arafah or the mountain of Arafah during this time, whether standing or sitting down, reclining or lying down, that fulfills the purpose. That means you are waqifun bi Arafah. You fulfill this pillar of Hajj. And Nabi Wasallam says, al Hajj Arafah. So if the person happens to be there at any moment from noon till the morning, till dawn of the next morning, the 10th day, uh, this is the meaning of al-wuqufu bi arafah Also, um, it does not necessarily have to be uh, in a certain position or a certain place. It said that Arafah is, the entire place is called Arafah. What people do sometimes and compete in climbing the mountain mm -hmm. and uh, uh, making an effort to be at a certain point is unnecessary. If you happen to be in any place, in any place in the entire valley of Arafah, that fulfills the purpose. Another thing, uh, the wajib or what's mandatory is to be there and to stay until sunset. Mm -hmm. Okay, that fulfills the mandatory part as well. Jazakallah khair. Okay, we've got a question about uh, the Hajj step-by-step guide that we're showing here in Khuda that you're in, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. Well, the question is, what is the difference between the pillars and the wajibat in Hajj? What is the main difference between them? This is a quite interesting and important question. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, this is related to the usul or the principles of fiqh, the understanding of uh, the jurisdictions of our deen. It's not only related to Hajj. When we say pillars, it's arkan, plural of rukn, mm. is a foundation or a pole that the building of the ibadah, the construction of the ibadah can never stand without any of them. 
if the person missed any of those pillars, the entire ibadah is void and invalid. And you cannot make, up, make it up by any means. Uh, for instance, in the salah, if you miss one rak'ah, if you miss the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha, if you miss a ruku' or sujood in any independent rak'ah, this entire rak'ah does not count, is void. So that means you have to make up another rak'ah. Similarly, in Hajj, the pillars of Hajj are as follows. Al-Ihram, Al-Tawaf, Tawaf al ithada uh, followed by al sai the day of Arafah, so we've got four, Ihram, Tawaf, Sa'i, and the day of Arafah, or Al-Wuqufu bi Arafah, on the ninth day of Arafah, with the intention. By the meaning, you have to be having this intention of Al-Wuqufu bi Arafah. So people who are just working, they are serving the people and so on, and they don't have the intention to perform Hajj. That does not really uh, fit in our uh, case. Uh, these are the pillars of Hajj. The pillars of Umrah, uh, which if you miss any of them, the Umrah is void unless you complete it. Al-Ihram as well, Al-Tawaf, then Al-Sa'i. Al-Wajibat or the mandatory acts, these are acts which we must do. But if in case that the person wasn't able to do any of them, he can make it up by offering a penalty, which we call it Al-Fidya, mm -hmm. okay, which is lowering a sheep uh, at the place of the violation of the Wajib. Uh, give me an example. Al-Ihram is a pillar mm -hmm. and you can never perform Hajj or Umrah without making Ihram mm -hmm. and assuming the intention of convincing in the act of uh, performing uh, Umrah or Hajj. Yet assuming the intention of Ihram from Al-Miqat, the proper appointed place, is a must, is a wajib. That if the person passed this appointed place, which were appointed by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu whether flying, sailing, walking, driving, and passed this point, crossed it without making the intention of Ihram and the Talbiyah, they must go back to the same point if they can, and if they can't, they have missed the wajib, which they may make it up if it is not possible to go back, such as if he was flying, they can make it up by slaughtering a sheep and distributing it all on the poor people. They cannot take any piece of it. So another wajib, uh, spending the night of the Eid, the night that precedes the Eid, after leaving Arafah at the place of Muzdalifah. This is a wajib, to spend most of the night, the Prophet Sallallahu spend the entire night until he prayed Fajr uh, uh, in Muzdalifah. This is a must, spend the night in Muzdalifah. Throw in the stones and in order, this is a wajib, on the Eid day and on the following e uh, uh, days of Ayyam al-Tashriq. Spend in the nights at Mina on the 11th, 11th and uh, 13th, that's optional, is also a wajib. If a person does not do it, then they must give the fidya any state. And giving the fidya would make up or compensate for the deficiency of the wajib. Versus al rukn there is nothing can make it up, but you have to do it yourself. Such as the brother who left Mecca without doing tawaf al ifada who said mm -hmm. that uh, you have no choice but to come back to perform tawaf al ifada Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Okay, we've got a question regarding the halal, okay? What's the difference between the first and the second? And could you give us some explanation on, on the state of the halal? Tahallul is to exit the state of ihram. Mm -hmm. Once you assume the intention of ihram, there will be some restrictions you must avoid. There will be a certain outfit you must do. And once you complete the umrah rituals, for instance, or the Hajj rituals, now you're ready to do Tahallul. And Tahallul can be done by shaving or trimming the hair. Exactly. This is Tahallul. <laughs> in Hajj, this is done simply in Umrah. In Hajj, there will be uh, Tahallul Azgar and Tahallul Akbar. Or Tahallul Awwal and Tahallul Thani, the first and the second. At Tahallul Al Awwal, simply by shaving or trimming, or by doing one of three things. <laughs> By doing, by doing uh, two of three things, uh, either a tawaf or uh, uh, shaving or throwing the stones. If the person threw the stones, al-jamarat, and shaved or trimmed his hair, now he's in a state of tahallul, that he may do anything was restricted during ihram except for one thing, which is having a husband and wife relationship, al jima yani a sexual mm -hmm. intercourse, or its introductions. To be able to have this kind of relationship with his wife, 
then he must do the second tahallul or the major tahallul by offering tawaf. Once a person does the tawaf, now he is in a state of complete tahallul. Anything and everything was restricted during ihram, now is permissible for him to do. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. So the question that I had next was, what were the main restrictions of ihram and um, should not do basically while you're in the state of ihram? There are some mahzurat or restrictions which are shared between uh, men and women, mm -hmm. such as number one, of course, having a sexual intercourse. Or al-mubashara. And I began by having a sexual intercourse because this is an act which if they happen to do, the hajj is void. There is nothing can make it up. Not only that. There is a huge penalty, which is slaughtering a badana or a camel. Mm -hmm. This is a fidya. And also, they have to continue, go on, on the completion of their hajj, even though it's void. Third, they have to come next year to make up this void hajj, if they have the means. Even if it was a voluntary hajj, now it has become mandatory to make it up since they void it willingly. So this is the biggest and the first restriction which everybody should keep in mind, especially those who are traveling along with their spouses. Then there are some restrictions shared as well, such as clipping the nails, mm -hmm. and shaving or removing any hair from the entire body. Let it be the head, the eyebrows, the mustache, the beard. Mm -hmm. Any hair is restricted to remove anything from the body while in a state of ihram. Men are not allowed to cover their heads while women are not allowed to cover their faces and hands, the ihram of a woman is by wearing her regular everyday clothes, but uncovering the face and the hands. And that takes us to another very interesting thing, which is if a woman should uncover the hands and the face during ihram, that means she's supposed to be normally covered outside the state of ihram. And that's why uh, we would recommend and ask the sisters, while uncovering the face in ihram, if they happen to pass by men who are not mahram, or men passing by them, to lower their isdal to cover their face if they were normally wearing uh, the niqab or covering their face. Uh, men are not allowed to wear any stitched clothes. All their outfits should be seamless. And this is what we see, the izar, a towel to be wrapped around the waist, and a rida', which is another towel to be placed on both shoulders. It, uh, uh, it feels funny in the beginning that you're not wearing anything beneath that. There is no underwear whatsoever. But that takes you back to the same day you were born and it takes you future to uh, the process of rubbing, uh, uh, rubbing the body with the shroud and preparing the deceased to be buried. Very, very simple form of outfit that would not recognize rich from poor. Jazakallah Okay, we've got one question before we go to the break, and it's actually connected to this. I mean, the penalties of violating these restrictions. I mean, I know there's different types of penalties, but could you just give a, a brief introduction to them? Uh, well, for violating any of the restrictions of ihram or doing them, we have to differentiate between several cases. The first case, if somebody does that unknowingly or uh, not deliberately, that somebody was sitting and all of a sudden he forgot that he's in a state of ihram. Mm -hmm. So he dressed up and he wore his uh, outer garment and he uh, put the coffee or the cap mm -hmm. or the head cover and wore his socks and so on. Mm -hmm. So somebody said, uh, brother, you're in ihram. Have you forgotten? So right away, the ransom for that is to take that off and to ask Allah for forgiveness. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would forgive us in any case that we forget. <laughs> Similarly, if a person does that unknowingly, he doesn't know that was one of the restrictions of ihram. He's playing with his beard and he took off some hair. Somebody reminded him this is haram. Mm. So he was reminded and he sought forgiveness. This is the penalty or the ransom for it. There is no tangible or financial penalty in that regard. Uh, the other case is if a person have to, due to a valid reason, he knows that it is restricted to shave or trim. Mm -hmm or to clip the nails, but he broke one of the nails and he has to remove it. It's painful, it's hurting. Or uh, like in another incident, uh, uh, one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu had lice mm. in his head. So when the Prophet Sallallahu saw him in that shape, he said, I didn't know that it was hurting you that much. Go ahead and shave mm. and give the fidya. Mm -hmm. The fidya, 
as the Quran is stated, فَصِيَامٌ فَفِدْيَةٌ مِّن صِيَامٍ أَوْ صَدَقَةٍ أَوْ نُسُكٍ الصيام for fasting for three days. Or الإطعام feeding six poor people, six مساكين. أو نسك slaughtering a sheep and distributing its meat among the poor at the same place where you made a violation. Let's say that uh, I have to uh, 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 shave. And that happened in Mina or happened in Mecca. In this case, I may do that and give the fidya if I chose to slaughter. But a person would have the choice between the three choices, either fasting for three days, feeding six masakeen, or slaughtering a sheep. Jazakallah khair with that. Inshallah, we're going to go uh, to a short break. I'll leave you with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum. Ask Hoda. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to a new edition of Ask Hoda. I have two questions. Please go ahead. You can read it in Arabic and you can also understand the meaning in your own language. The different tafsir and the interpretation of the meanings of the Quran uh, are available in almost every language that exists on earth by the grace of Allah. The water of Zamzam is for whatever intention you drink it with. Salih from Egypt. His father has the way and he asked about how can he help him. Very good question. Can we give a zakat to any of the Dawah centers? The ibadah or the act of worship is a part of the unity of worship. It has to be paid to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in accordance with the guidance of his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ask Huda. Okay, like I said before, no telephone calls, please. This is a special program just about our emails, inshallah. Okay, Sheikh, we had uh, some speech earlier about what to avoid when in ikhram. What about what's permissible while you're in ikhram? Uh, anything besides what we mention as the mahdurat or the restrictions of ikhram is permissible, such as taking a shower, changing your ihram clothes, being clean. Just avoid, of course, uh, we uh, did not mention that among the restrictions of ihram, uh, wearing any cologne, fragrance, or any scented uh, substances, even using uh, scented soap or shampoo, that a person should avoid uh, during the state of ihram, whether men or women. Also, uh, uh, consuming a marriage contract uh, or performing a marriage contract during the state of ihram is restricted. And hunting, which, uh, which is not very common nowadays, but it is one of the restrictions uh, of ihram, of course. Besides that, talking, eating, shopping, uh, uh, sleeping, uh, uh, changing your ihram clothes, taking a bath, is all permissible. Uh, it reminds me right now with a very funny thing that um, people think, that they panic. They mm. think that uh, ihram means everything in life is haram. And they're on high alert. Mm. A person should be on high alert, but not to, the, uh, to, to that extent, to the, to the point that uh, he, he asks before he drinks, is it halal to drink or not? Is it okay to eat or not? Is it okay? Uh, for instance, a person last year flew from JFK through uh, uh, France to Jeddah airport. And uh, he was under the impression that uh, once you are in a state of ihram, you cannot pass urine. You cannot urinate, nor you cannot avoid your wudu. So he was retaining his urine all the time until he couldn't anymore. So when he had to do it, he thought his ihram is void. So he took off his ihram clothes and he dressed up. Oh. He said, it's, it's all messed up. Uh, you know, uh, it would be much better if you spend some time to educate yourself. A hajj is a very, very simple process. But uh, indeed, we make it difficult upon ourselves. In addition to, some people fall as victims of some yellow pages, those yeah. yellow books which they read that uh, you have to do this and you have to avoid that and some uh, unknown fatwas and so on. We're supposed to ask the, the learned people and the scholars. 
the Hajj is an, is an excellent act of worship. And for the vast majority of those who perform Hajj, it's done just once per lifetime. So before you pack your luggages, prepare yourself mentally. What am I going to do? Educate yourself, attend classes as uh, teachers. And nowadays, alhamdulillah, in every language, it's available to learn how to perform Hajj before actually going there. I feel very sorry for people who happen to uh, arrive to Jeddah airport and they're all dressed up. Where are you going? We're going to Mecca to do what? To do Umrah. And now they're ready to, uh, uh, to exchange an ihram clause. You've just violated one of the mandatory acts of ihram, which is assuming the ihram at the appointed miqat, mm -hmm. which have passed while you're flying. Before arriving to Jeddah airport, if you're flying from here or there, according to your uh, uh, first destination, you should have learned where to assume the intention of ihram. Some flights, the flight attendant would announce that we're mm -hmm. passing by the miqat. Mm -hmm. And there, you announce the miqat. If there is no way or mean to find out if you are on a foreign uh, uh, air flight uh, and you don't know where to announce the intention of ihram, then from your beginning point, put your ihram on and a couple of hours before you arrive, announce the intention of ihram. This is better than <laughs> just entering Jeddah without announcing the intention of ihram at all and announcing the talbiyah. This, this goes to the question of superstition in our deen. Unfortunately, many people, like you said, it's a journey of a lifetime. They've saved up all their life. They're only going to do this act once in their lifetime. But they fall foul to all these superstitions and whatever they read. What's the main advice to these people regarding falling uh, in lieu of these kind of uh, acts? What's the best way to avoid all of this? How should they prepare themselves really? Uh, Islam, unlike any other religion, is very unique in a very important uh, point, which is everything is clear and obvious. There is no place for hidden and superstition. Ask. If you have any question, ask and find out. That gives you brightness. That makes things very easy for you. Mm -hmm. Imagine that a woman who starts her period while she's in a state of ihram. Right away, her husband or somebody who is mahram with, with her would say, oh, your ihram is void. This is something out of our control. This is something which Allah have ordained on all the daughters of Fa'ib. And this is exactly what the Prophet Sallallahu said to Aisha. As she was approaching Mecca, and he saw that she was sad and crying, he said, oh, your period must have started. She said, yes. Mm -hmm. He said, don't be sad. This is something that Allah ordained on the daughters of Eve. Do everything that the pilgrim would do, including the ihram and the talbiyah and everything, except a tawaf. You go to Arafah, you go to Mina, you go to Muzdalifah, you throw the stones. And once you're all cleaned up, now you can do a tawaf And you can follow it by a sa'ah. Uh, if you ask, إِنَّمَا دَوَاءُ الْعِيِّ سُعَالِ If you have any problem, ask. Before trying to uh, figure out a solution or give it a wild guess. No wild guesses in the ibadat. Exactly. Okay, we've got a question which is really related to all those people who are not going to be able to perform hajj. What is the way or how do they actually get involved in the spirit of Hajj? What can they do to find themselves in this spirit? Of course, there is nothing really can match their word of performing Hajj. Mm -hmm. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Hajj al mabruru laysa lahu jaza'un illa al-jannah. I mean, the compensation for Hajj is not less than paradise. You know, <laughs> this is the, the, the reward. This is the, the, the cash you get for performing an accepted Hajj. If you fulfill all the steps and the guidelines which the Nabi Sallallahu prescribed in his Hajj when he said uh, 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 your Hajj if it is done from lawful earning will be accepted the reward is guaranteed Al-Jannah and Nabi Sallallahu says in another sound hadith that Man falam walam yafsuk, yawmi ummu. imagine that once you perform Hajj once you finish with the day of Arafah and the sun sets now you're only uh, one hour old you're a newborn, you're a baby. You are completely pure and sinless. Only you have in your record the good deeds which you've done throughout your entire life. But the bad deeds have, uh, deeds have been forgiven after a sincere repentance and asking for forgiveness on that day. So there is nothing really can match uh, this ibadah. Of course, not everybody is um, capable to perform it. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا Every believer, every Muslim uh, is eager to perform Hajj. But due to the high cost and the journey, 
not every person can afford it so people can do other things not to match but to get close by such as the first 10 days of the month of Dhul Hijjah are very great days the Prophet Sallallahu said uh, there is no better days or no better act of worship could be done in any time better than the first 10 of Dhul Hijjah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used them as an oath in Surah Al-Fajr al -fajr, ashr. So basically the person who is not performing Hajj is recommended to observe fasting during the days of uh, the first 10 days of the month of Dhul Hijjah The ninth day, the ninth day which is the day of Arafah The Prophet sallallahu said Suyamu Arafah Observing fasting on the day of Arafah Is an expiation for one sins which were done in the past year and a year to come so it is recommended, highly recommended for people who are not performing Hajj to fast on that day and it is disliked and prohibited for people who are performing Hajj to observe fasting on that day they must eat and drink to be capable to do Ibadah and to make supplication and ask for forgiveness throughout the day while they are standing in the valley or happen to be in the valley of Arafah or at the Mount of uh, Arafah uh, so a, per, a person who's not performing Hajj with his sincere intention also that he says, Oh Allah, that I wish I uh, would have the means or I was capable to perform Hajj. If he has the means but he is not capable physically, then he must hire somebody or pay somebody or appoint somebody to perform Hajj and pay and cover the cost of his journey because he's financially capable. Mm -hmm. If not, I hope. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with one sincere intention that he would grant him the same reward. Since the Prophet sallallahu said uh, while he was during the battle of Tabuk that many people came to him and they wanted to join him but he did not have the financial means to carry them with him. So he made a beautiful statement when he announced to his companions that there are some people who are left behind in Al-Madinah that he did not cross any valley or march through any mountain but they were with us they shared with us their word. They did not get out of al Medina yet. Mm -hmm. They shared with us their word. <laughs> they were there, they were restrained for a valid excuse. So with the intention, inshallah, a person hopefully will get the same reward. What about, for example, Sheikh, regarding the sacrifice now? We know that many people do the sacrifice who don't go to, to Hajj. So what's the real difference between their sacrifice and the sacrifice that the pilgrims make in Hajj? There is something called Udhiyah mm -hmm. and there is something called Hajj and there is something called Fidya mm -hmm. even though the animal is the same mm -hmm. uh, we may slaughter a sheep in all the cases mm -hmm. in the first case al Udhiyah is a confirmed tradition for those who are financially capable you brother Jamil for instance you offer an Udhiyah by slaughtering a sheep on the Eid day Eid al-Adha and you distribute one third of it on the poor and one third your relatives and friends and you keep one third for yourself uh, you eat from it and uh, your family. This is al uthiya There are some traditions, of course, if you're not performing hajj, uh, you must not shave or trim or take anything from your hair or nails. The person who is intending to do the uthiya since the first day of the hijjah mm -hmm. until you sacrifice your uthiya. This is al uthiya al hadi is a mean of giving gratitude, showing gratitude, being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he have helped us to perform hajj. So on the 10th day, of uh, the month of Dhul Hijjah and after we return from uh, Arafah in the morning of the month of Dhul Hijjah we recommended to slaughter a sheep per person per each individual who is performing Hajj so if you happen to go for Hajj you and your wife and your kids one sheep per each person or for innocent seven can participate or share in offering or slaughtering a camel the way we dispense its meat similar to Al-Udhiyah mm -hmm. both of them are completely different than the fidya or the penalty or the ransom because in this case you're not allowed even to taste it or take or preserve any of its meat for yourself it should be uh, uh, slaughtered and distributed among the poor in the same locality where you've made the violation Jazakallah. now we, the last question uh, for today is something which is uh, 
asked all the time and it's a very very personal question it's regarding doing hajj for your parents for example uh, the brother asks if i do hajj for my parents and both of them have passed away may allah have mercy on them um how do i go about doing this is it permissible and uh, who do i do hajj for first or can i do them both together at the same time and hajj on al-ghayr or performing hajj on behalf of others is prescribed and it is permissible <laughs> It took place more than once that uh, a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said that Abi Shaykhun Kabir, my father is very old, is senile and cannot perform Hajj. Am I allowed to perform Hajj on his behalf? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do so. And a woman said that my father is an old man and he cannot stand on the back of his ride. He cannot travel. Can I perform Hajj on, on his behalf? He said, yes. But with the condition that the person who is performing Hajj on behalf of others should perform hajj on behalf of himself first, fulfill the farida of himself first, then afterward he is uh, permissible, uh, permitted to perform hajj on behalf of anybody else, whether it's parents, relatives, beloved ones, or as long as the parents are being physically incapable or passed away without performing hajj in this case, it's recommended for him to perform hajj on their behalf. So uh, an, a question <laughs> added to this, what about doing Hajj for somebody who's alive, who's financially capable and physically capable? Is, are you allowed to do Hajj for that person? Uh, for Hajj al-Farida, no. The person must perform Hajj on behalf of himself if he is financially and physically capable. Uh, this is not a job that you hire somebody to do it on your behalf. Or otherwise, a person could hire uh, somebody with his money if he's financially capable to pray on his behalf and fast on his behalf. No, al-ibadat, to achieve them and grasp on them by your own self once you have the power to do so. Uh, nobody can do it on your behalf except in Hajj if you're not physically capable or if the person passed away. And of course, if you want to do Hajj on behalf of somebody else since we're talking about the parents, not to misunderstand that one at a time. You cannot just go and perform Hajj لبيك اللهم حجا on behalf of my parents. No, uh, it, it will not be accepted this way. One at a time. If you're going to ask me whom shall I begin with, I would say, as the Prophet Sallallahu when he was asked, uh, who have more rights upon me? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Salam. your mother. And the question was repeated thrice. And each time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, your mother, your mother, your mother, have more rights than anybody else with you. So in the fourth time, then uh, the companion said, and then whom? The Prophet mm. Sallallahu said, then your father. So of course, I would advise you to perform Hajj on behalf of your mother first, then inshallah, if Allah gives you the power and the means next year to perform Hajj on behalf of your father. Jazakallah khair. We've got, still got a bit of time, so I'm going to sneak a few more questions in. The first one is the meaning of this ayah. So seek your provision, and indeed, the best provision is taqwa. Can you give some explanation on, on this ayah for the brother? Uh, this verse was mentioned in the course of discussing Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَى which means, and seek your own provision. And indeed, the best of all provision is righteousness. Some people just uh, hang around, they just go to perform a hajj without having any means. And they start begging. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no, take your means for the journey. And this is exactly the proper tawakkul which is put in your trust and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take enough uh, provision with you, food, means, uh, financial means I mean. And do not forget, the best mean of provision is righteousness and taqwa. As I said, that people shop for the packages and for the company and the group which are going to perform hajj. And they are very keen to know exactly and specific which hotel I'm going to stay at and how much I'm going to pay. They forget about the most important thing, which is learning what are the etiquettes of hajj. I'm going to perform a very sacred act of worship. What about, you know, the whole thing? Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to do it? Which manner should I adopt? And so on. And that's why with the first calamity, with the first affliction or conflict, they lose their temper. Because they are not equipped with the good manners. They are not prepared with the patience. So seek your own provision. And the best of all provision is, is righteousness and piety. Jazakallah. Okay, we've got a question uh, regarding something you, you spoke about. was the izar and the rida. Uh, the, the, the clothing you wear while you're in a state of ihram. Uh, we want to know what's the significance of the clothing. And with this, we've got a, the, the question says, what's the significance of uh, the black stone, of kissing the black stone, of touching the black stone while performing umrah? 
uh, mankind in general are superficial. They evaluate people from their luck. Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not do that. As in the hadith explains that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not evaluate you by looking at your bodies or your uh, uh, pictures or figures. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala examines your heart. To your hearts. The hearts are hidden. When we go to perform hajj, millions of people are coming from every corner on the globe. Uh, many of them are rich, many are poor, many are ministers, pre presidents, guards, mm -hmm. uh, teachers, physicians. It's a mix of every color, every shape. There, when we perform hajj, this is a scene which is very, very unique. It reminds us with the day which all of us will be presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. You forget whom you are. You only remember one thing, that you are a believer. You put yourself down to earth. You humble yourself before Allah and before others. Imagine while performing tawaf, uh, and I see everybody is dressed up the same. Mm. There is no way that you could know this person is poor or rich at all. There is no way that you figure out this person is the prime minister of another country. Unless, of course, he's surrounded with guards. But the proper way that everybody would perform tawaf in the same manner. Everybody would do sa'i in the same way. This is the same way we arrive to this life. Have no means, no power, no strength. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted us all of that. Knowledge, power, money. So people tend to uh, have an ego and tend to have some pride due to the, the means which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided them with. And now we're going to be stripped off from all those means and back to reality, back to the childhood mm -hmm. and to the future where we remember our return and remember that we're all in need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one would ever belittle anybody else next to them due to their color or race. Rather, you see people next to you shedding tears and crying and you cannot control yourself but you join them because you all know that you came here to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness and beg him to receive salvation on the day of judgment you're not concerned about your outfit mm -hmm. about your tie about your suit and the brand name of your clothes or your shirt you're a very simple person this could never be examined or felt or sensed anywhere else but at this sacred place and during performing Hajj or Umrah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to really accept the Hajj of all the brothers and sisters who are going to perform Hajj and, and bring them safely back to their home countries. And until the next program, I leave you with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Wa Alaikum Assalamu wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh.